Welcome, welcome back to this next session of this book study, this wonderful book, this wonderful book by Dr. Brueggemann that has meant so much to us already. We are glad to be here today with you to help spur on your own individual study of chapters two and three. We are Dan Westner. Peter Hulak, again, loving the chance to work together to, to be with you. Um, the, the questions before us look like this. Um, <clears throat> how do we look to God in crisis? What do we learn about looking to God in crisis from the biblical stories, the witness? How do we view ourselves? How do we view our own inner workings? Um, and what does it mean to be people of faith? How do we understand faith now? Now the life is different. Here's a working answer. Thinking and speaking critically, theologically, biblically, um, what what do we do about a crisis? Do we just merely look, say someday it'll be over soon and we can be normal again? Uh, Brueggemann would say no. <clears throat> Brueggemann would say let no crisis, whether it be sword, famine, or pestilence, let no crisis like that go to waste. So to be faithful to that theory, to that thought, let us pledge deepen our relationships with God and with one another and, and prepare ourselves for this, this big change ahead. Recent, to week, recent weeks have showed us that we have not just the crisis of pestilence with coronavirus, not just the threat of famine with planet change, and not just some theoretical word called sword, but with the actual truth that we are looking at war, that war is being inflicted on innocent people by a small group of others who have the power to wield it with no understanding about the value, the importance, the call to change swords into plowshares, to change tanks into baby carriages. None at all. So with those challenges, here we are. Does this war, this climate change, this racism, this, all these calamities, how do they summon us to faith? Dan, what do you think? Well, building on the question that you left us with last week, which was you know, we've got the vaccines in hand. Yeah, we could say that. So why read this book? Um, we can move on. And knowing that you were not 100% serious with your question because you knew we needed to move on, um, you know, Mr. Putin has made it more than evident that we must move on. We must think critically about sword, famine, pestilence together, the triad not just in the times of the prophets and the exile of the Israelites, but today, in 2022. The context that you've given us, we talked about last week, but let me just very quickly summarize it again, is really a cascade of calamities. A cascade that includes, and these are the things that you've given us, racism, divisiveness, the war and the chaos of Ukraine and hopefully nothing broader than that. The very weak discourse in civil society fed by a weak discourse through the media. The effect of the virus on education, especially education of younger children. The waves of the virus, the fatigue of this variant, then that variant, then that variant. Others were 
for stressing that this cascade of calamities includes especially our, our culture of consumerism, our culture of waste, our inattentiveness to climate crises, um, both within our state and, and globally in other states, uh, the growth of nationalism and fear. Others told us that the context includes just we are people of too fragile a faith. How can we strengthen our faith? Uh, how can we, as a people of strengthened faith, face collective trauma? How can it help us search more keenly for God? And how can we find, again and again, greater and deeper and broader relevance of the church as we look for God in a crisis? All of that, all those cascading calamities, that's our context. And then the concepts that Dr. Brueggemann has given us are to think biblically, theologically, historically through this prism, along with the prophets of the Old Testament. How have people of faith in the past dealt with the triad of pestilence, famine, and war? That triad is a, a prism, and through that prism, what is it that people of faith turn to? And the three... Um, things that Brueggemann has stressed, we turn to a covenantal relationship with God. Two, we turn to a God whose purposeful intent is to see uh, the universe unfold according to God's intent. That's a great power. And the third understanding of God is that God has a raw, holy power that is beyond our comprehension. It's inscrutable. Um, Marjorie uh, kept reiterating that it is eternal and it's infinite. We cannot get our, our minds, our enlightenment, our science wrapped around all that God has in God's power. And then finally, the other thing that we've been working through in adult faith formation was the three-part series on black theology. So also part of our prism, we can think of um, what Malcolm said, uh, the theology of Martin Luther King Jr. or the theology of Malcolm X. And what Marjorie added beyond those two men and beyond all the, the white male theologians, what about womanist theology? What about black African-American womanist theology? So Brueggemann invites us to identify more and more theologies. There are a lot of theologies. This is our, our best effort as humans to um, think and feel and illustrate and speak about what we believe God to be teaching us. So in chapter two, let's build on those uh, that context that you've given us, the concepts that Brueggemann has given us, and let's see what he teaches us in chapter two. Uh, first of all, he says, <clears throat> don't think for one moment that there is any ready transfer from this biblical narrative mm -hmm. to our real life crisis with the virus. The Bible does not often easily apply. The Bible is relevant, but don't look for a proof text. Don't look for um, an exact precedent that's going to say this is what you do in this context. Quite the opposite. Uh, by the end of chapter 2, where Brueggemann takes us, this is through the story of King David as told in 2 Samuel, he takes us to a point where you need to be exercising open imagination based on that prism of how people have faced calamities before, through the covenant, through God's purposeful intent, through God's raw holy power, through black theology, through womanist theology, through other theologies that you're going to identify, use all of that lens to strengthen an open imagination as to where God might be leading people of faith right now. So to the story of David, uh, and you've looked at this probably uh, in reading chapter two before uh, viewing this video. Um, but what has David done wrong? This is retold in 2 Samuel chapter 24, 
what has he done wrong? Uh, what is the great sin that King David has committed? And it's this. Um, as a king of a minor state surrounded by big, powerful states, and you can think of analogies to the present day, but don't think of exact proof texts from then to now. But King David of this small state has done exactly what big states do. He's conducted a census. He's counted everybody. He's increased his tax roll. So people who are already stressed, already paying more than they feel they probably should pay to the state, are now in a census and on the rolls to pay more. And the other thing that he's done as a statesman is conscript people into a military. These are what states do. So his sin is he's relied on the strength of statism. He's relied on being a state, just like the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Egyptians. He's relied on these political institutions rather than depending upon God, rather than depending upon the covenant or having an open imagination to what God's purpose might be, or having an open imagination to the infinite and to the uh, extraordinary, inscrutable, holy raw power of God. So, David, being a man of faith, as well as a statesman, realizes that he has offended the covenant. And God, in a very interpersonal exchange with David, uh, basically tells him to pick his poison. Is it going to be war? Is it going to be famine? Is it going to be pestilence? And, you know, this might be precisely historical. This might also be literary because again and again in the Old Testament, that triad of those three things just keep recurring. The same language, uh, the same one, two, three, one, two, three. And in this dialogue between God and David, here's the triad. Why does David pick pestilence as his poison? And not just his, but for the Israelites, over war and famine. He reasons that, well, if I pick war, then I'm putting my people and myself into the unknown human calamity of a warring state against Israel. If I pick famine, I'm placing my people and myself in the unknown effect of nature and human misjudgment in working with nature and farming systems and providing food. I'm going to pick pestilence because God visiting frogs or locusts or any kind of pestilence upon people, that's in God's province. That's God's power. And I think. David is thinking, I think I understand God best of all of my choices. And what I really understand about God, and this is the important point, what I really understand about God is the covenantal relationship. And in that covenantal relationship, if people of faith repent, if I repent, if people have trust in the covenantal relationship with God, as I have that trust, then God will show mercy, God will show love. God will help us understand again the moral coherence of life, of the world, of the universe. And that's what Brueggemann means by open imagination. David has opened his imagination by thinking through that prism and understanding in a deeper way for himself and for all of his people uh, the importance of that covenantal relationship. That open imagination allows Israel, as a people, to be something extraordinary. Not an ordinary state, not an ordinary society, but something extraordinary. Not victims wallowing in victimhood. Not people always in lamentation. Not clamoring for normalcy. What was it like before the pestilence? Before the virus? Before whatever? But an open imagination to something transformed. That leads us then into chapter three. Chapter three is a wonderful invitation to 
consider hope, to consider what it means. Um, what can we hope that we'll be able to sing and dance again? And um, <clears throat> our choir has spent a year hoping for an opportunity to sing again. So, Dan, do I have this right? I will um, lead our friends in singing, and you'll lead them in dancing. Do we? Is that how we agreed on that? Just so long as it's not liturgical dance. <laughs> the, uh, um, <clears throat> We are invited by Brueggemann to think about this concept called hope. Um, that word hope is used a lot these days. Boy, if you listen to sports casts and weather casts, they have it. Well, hopefully the snow won't be too bad, or ho ho hopefully the team will will come together and pull out a victory. Hopefully, and it, it's sort of one of those. Uh, easily spoken words that um, might really miss the mark. And it's based on the hope that you know if we work hard enough and decide that we'll get to it, we'll get hope, and rather than this concept that hope is this wonderful eternal thing that draws us, that draws us into life, into today, tomorrow, the future. Um, <clears throat> Jeremiah's words here are appropriate. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. That's a different kind of hope than thinking, oh, I'm just going to try to, you know, think positively and it's all going to work out. So shall we, with Jeremiah, hope for this thing called a rich social thickness? Something much better than getting back to normal. Um, Brueggemann's words maybe express, express it better than anyone when he says, hope is a conviction that God will not quit until God has arrived at God's good intention. Much different thing from, I'm going to try to be positive. This is more cosmic. This is something which we hope to grow into. Um, a couple thoughts. I, um, you all hear the words hopefully uh, used if somebody has a crisis. And so, you know, gosh, I'm really having a bad day. And a friend will say, well, hopefully it'll all work out. Um, that we, Others these days have called that toxic positivity. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something that is just profound. <clears throat> um, and um, Brueggemann uses the, the words of Martin Rinkhart, that um, the, the, a hymn writer, a, a, a pastor of 30, after the Thirty Years' War, um, who had suffered through the death of so many family members because of the plague, the pestilence of the time, and Rinkhart wrote the words that we sing regularly. Now thank we all our God with heart and hand and voices. <clears throat> Rinkhart's hope, Jeremiah's hope, Brueggemann's hope, our hope, is not that we'll come up with something that will neutralize the pain, but something that is rooted in it. So Rinkhart wrote, now thank we all our urging us to do what he did, to say, this is real life, this is grief, this is tough stuff, and I choose to anchor my soul to hope. Um, and then Brueggemann leads us into uh, this concept called chesed. You might just try saying that, chesed you have the opportunity to uh, gargle a little bit with the first H there. Um, this wonderful Hebrew word, um, which is translated in various ways, but Brueggemann's translation is tenacious solidarity. And it incorporates much more neighborliness, hospitality, truth, courage, purpose, trust, not fear, 
not self-preoccupation, not victimhood, not nostalgia for the old normal, but the hope. So, in closing, under, understand Brigham and Pete and Dan here, um, and, and Pastor Ringhart from the 17th century. We're not giving thanks for the calamity. <laughs> Ringhart is not singing, we thank the God for calamity. It's the calamity is penultimate. What comes after it, as with David, <clears throat> as with Jeremiah, is the ultimate, and that ultimate is the tenacious solidarity, the hesed, the hopefulness. And, and that's why we can be thankful even in the midst of cascading calamities. Um, we're recording this for you as part of our flipped classroom approach to the Lenten series, hoping that you'll, you'll view this and look at the PowerPoint and read the chapter, and most especially come to the Wednesday evening session with your questions, with your insights, with your experience, with reflection and synthesis of all of this that's going on. Uh, you know, today is uh, February 27th. Uh, we don't talk about chapters two and three until the second session of the Lenten series. So that's gonna be a Wednesday evening, March 9th, no, March 16th. Okay, a lot is gonna happen between February 27th and March 16th. Uh, and this is where the flipped classroom calls upon you to be applying this and using the prism and thinking and praying and studying hard, bring all of that to the 90 minutes that we share together on the evening of March 16th. Um, that discussion is, that, that session is not for Pete and Dan teaching, it's for us to discuss, for us to experience, for us to listen hard and for us to discern. So in closing, here are some questions. How is the virus a summons to faith and change? In fact, what sort of faith and change? And with whom? And why? And how? Where and how might we engage this remarkable Hesed type of faith and change? So we look forward to seeing you on the 16th.